Hello again, this is Ian O'Byrne, and this is our second module of the Online Research and Media Skills class. Uh, this module, what we're doing is taking a look at online collaborative inquiry. Uh, this module, this element is poised up at the top of the other two, online reading comprehension and online content construction. We'll get to those in later weeks. In many ways, this might be the most challenging of the three, primarily because we'd be focusing on having students synthesize and collaborate and work with each other. Uh, the first thing that we'd like to do is talk about a, an initial summary so we know where the learning is going. So this is a short tweetable summary, 140 characters. And basically, we define online collaborative inquiry as a group of local or global learners, and they're trying to reach a common outcome by co-constructing and collaborating uh, multiple pathways of knowledge to create one text. One of the reasons why that this is important is because the future that our students are going to go into is going to demand much of this learning. The virtual office for better or worse technology and globalization are creating startling changes in what it means to be on the job. Betsy Stark is tracking the new order of business and tonight begins our series, The Future of Work. Imagine a work world with no commute, no corporate headquarters, maybe no office in the physical world at all. For Bob Flavin, Janet Hoffman, and Joseph Jaffe, the future is already here. These days we do so much stuff by teleconferences and things um, that it doesn't matter where you are. Like 42% of IBM's 350,000 employees. I'm going to stop the recording there. You have access to this PowerPoint, to this Google Presenter piece, so you can go through and work through the slides on your own. You can also watch this video on your own. But basically what they're talking about is the fact that the workplace that our students will be going into, a lot of these skills that we primarily privilege in our classroom aren't going to be needed. We need our students to be able to go online or go to some online resource or go to some collaborative text work with others, collaborate with others, search and, and co-construct knowledge. And that's one of the main elements of online collaborative inquiry, is working not only individually, but also collaboratively on some project-based learning. One of the biggest elements of this, one of the things that makes it the most exciting in our classroom, is we have the opportunity to build up and assess our students' digital footprint over time. So basically what we have is students can, you know, as a concrete example, students can put together a blog post or some piece of writing or a digital product at the beginning of the year. And then over the course of the year, we can look and see how well students performed. Did they learn? Did they have struggles? What were challenges? And we can repeatedly come back and look at student work over time and look at some growth over the course of the year. And this, for the most part, mimics what's happening in society as we have, or we should have, a positive digital footprint and a positive digital identity. Sometimes, though, we have an identity um, that we either are not aware of or an identity that's negative and it negatively affects us. Once again, I'm not going to go through and watch the video here and record it, but you have access to these videos. The primary point of this video, what it's trying to get across is that we do have a digital footprint. And a lot of times people in business or people that are trying to hire us or as we socialize as a community, people go online and they search for others. And whether or not you choose to be part of this online environment, the fact of the matter is that the way that online information is set up is you already do have a presence online. Whether or not you are 
in control of it, whether or not uh, you want to have an online identity, you already do have an online identity. And other people in the field do search for you and make decisions about you. My suggestion is that you work to positively create and curate your own online brand as opposed to letting what other people say about you be how it determines your identity. There are ways that you can create and curate your digital footprint. We have a lot of resources in the class that are set up that you can read and go in more detail. But basically, it, it comes down to a, a couple basic steps. Number one, who do you want to be online? We have multiple identities for multiple places. Uh, I, for example, am a former rugby player. I'm also a father. I also like to uh, play around with different, you know, with tablets or computer tools at my house, but I am also a pre-service educator and an educational researcher. Those are multiple different identities that for the most part, sometimes they do intersect, but for the most part, they don't. And so I have multiple identities that happen online. You have to decide what sort of identity you want to create and for what purpose. You also have to go in and you have to manage that identity. You have to put information online that supports who you are. You also have to, at times, edit or remove pieces of information. Now, it's pretty hard to remove stuff from online information from what people what comes up when people Google you. But if you have more information that's positive and supports a certain identity that you want to promote in an online space, then it will outweigh or has the tendency to outweigh some of what other people will put or say about you. And then also, by all means, please write yourself into being. What that means is go on some of these social networks, start a blog, promote yourself. Start off and promote your own blog and your own work or your own wiki page or your own about me page and share that out through different social networks so when it pops up, people can see and learn about the person that you want them to see as opposed to what other people say about you. Now there's a lot of different tools that we can use to build up these skills in students. Obviously, as educators, we need to figure out how they affect us, but we want to prepare our students for that classroom of the future and also prepare them for the future and help them work individually, also help them work collaboratively with others, and at the same time, manage their own online identity. Uh, Wikispaces that we've talked about before is a great tool that students can co-construct. Probably one of the most powerful tools students can use to co-construct knowledge. Padlet, formerly was known as Wallwisher, but Padlet is a great way that students can quickly and easily share online brainstorming resources. Google Groups or Google Communities is an online discussion group that we can use to set up a threaded discussion or a social network so students can go in and co-construct but also discuss and reflect. And then blogger or blogging tools such as WordPress, these are opportunities for our students to have their own online space where they can come back and create their own identity. Sometimes in our classroom there isn't one tool that serves all purposes. And so a lot of times what we do as educators or what we promote is using multiple tools to support one another. This video, once again, I'm not going to show the entire piece, but this video does a great job of posing one way that a teacher could position a lot of different tools and put together a lot of different tools to help students learn. Remember the good old days before the read, write web? When computers were just used for word processing and students made posters and filled out journals? Well, things have changed. This is Gamudali Kiog in plain English. Mary is a teacher, and she always wants her teaching to represent best practice. She wants her students to use higher order thinking. She wants them to do project-based work, to work collaboratively, to reflect. She wants them to think critically. She wants them to be organized. She wants her students to do real world work. She wants her students to get immediate feedback. She wants her instruction to include the most current information. Mary knows if she can find a way to do all these things, her class will be fun, successful, stimulating, inspiring, relevant, important, and challenging. So I'm going to stop us there. 
A couple of the key components of the video is number one, as I stated earlier, the teacher is putting together all these various tools to create the environment for her class that she wants. But the focus really is on student learning objectives and how this is going to change or improve or make her class more interesting, more stimulating, more rigorous, more challenging. Once again, we're focusing on student learning objectives. We're not focusing on the specific tools in the classroom. Please, by all means, go in and watch the video. It's embedded in the Google, in the presenter piece. But please go in and watch the video because it illustrates a number of points that are integral to this idea. So why is this important? There's a couple reasons why it's important for students to be able to work individually and collaboratively. Yes, we want to be able to prepare them for the future, but at the same time, there's a couple things that affect on the day-to-day -day basis what happens in our classroom. One of which is this Hegelian dialectic. And simply put, what we're looking at is students have their original idea or their thesis, and then in, in working with others, and trying to uh, come up with the ultimate work product, there's a lot of challenges along the way. In our classroom, a lot of times synthesis is one of the goals, but we don't focus on how challenging synthesis really is. In order to achieve synthesis, students need to think about their own ideas, think about ideas that may be antithetical to their ideas, and this might be other information sources, other biases, other points of view, but Ultimately, what happens here is there's tension that's created, and the student cognitively needs to think through these and needs to work through these elements of tension in order to achieve synthesis. That's difficult. Use of online tools and online co uh, collaborative inquiry, for the most part, what we can do is we can create a blog or a wiki or some online space in which students can go in and they can push pause on learning. They can put their learning up online or put their thoughts up online and think about it for a little bit and come back an hour or a day or a week later and think about their earlier statement or their earlier thesis. So this is one aspect that promotes the learning and, and why and it basically directs us to why online collaborative inquiry is an important element. There's another reason why this is important. Sometimes in our classroom, our students or we are focused entirely on things that are happening at the student's level or even at the classroom or broadly at the school level, but too little, too often, uh, very too few times do we have the opportunity to think globally about how this or what we're learning affects the students or affects other people globally. So online collaborative inquiry, if drafted the, the appropriate way, it provides us an opportunity to think globally, to move from the microscopic to the macroscopic level, to take a look at some of the elements that we're learning and think about, okay, let's talk about censorship in our classroom. How does this, how is this affected locally in our school? How does censorship affect you as a high school student, say? But then also, how does censorship affect other high school students globally? How does censorship affect other students globally? And then most of all, how does censorship or a topic of censorship affect people globally? So we want to provide some introspection as to different ways that this learning or what we're teaching in the classroom affects not only the micro level and the microcosm of school, but the macro level. Then finally, another reason why this is possibly important is that this is an opportunity for students to review and reflect upon what they've learned. So they can think about something we learned in class and think about a way that a character would deal with a solution in a piece of text. You know, we're, we're reading a narrative. And the student can think about, okay, how, how does this refer to or apply to things that I've dealt with in my own life? And then in thinking about my own problems, because a lot of our adolescents have situations that they're dealing with that are problematic, then we go ahead and we have the student, or as a group, or collaboratively, we think about, well, 
globally, how do others deal with this situation? So we're going to move from the, the local, we're going to move from thinking about our own problems and then move to what the world says about this, and then bring it back to how the student or how the class thinks they should deal with a problem, and then evaluate that and then bring it back to the original element where we reflected on the problem. So this is an, an element that sometimes we, we call in, in psychology abstracted replay. But what we're doing is the student is actively reflecting on not only their own answer or their own work product, but they're also reflecting on the work process involved. So we have students thinking about a problem in an aspect of text. It could be in science curriculum and dealing with global warming. The student could work with a group of students and think about, okay, the, the problem that we're studying here is global warming. We want to look at how other people in the world deal, what are the possible solutions, and then think about the group of students and what they think the solution should be. Then they think about these and evaluate what their beliefs and their answer would be, and then we come back to the original situation or the, the, the statement of the problem and figure out what did they learn through this process of inquiry. So there's a way for our students to think critically and evaluate not only work process, but work product, and constantly reflect about what they've learned. There are global ways, there are global systems that are already set up out there for students to connect and collaborate. There's four great opportunities listed here. Once again, you can go through and click these links in the Google Presenter piece and check out these different communities, one of which that I, I need to highlight is the ePals Global Community. In terms of full disclosure, I previously worked for ePals for uh, a, about a period of a year. I helped them write some of the curriculum and identify different digital skills that students should work on. ePals offers students and schools a safe online classroom where students from Classrooms all over the globe can go online and they can communicate with other classrooms and basically work through projects together. So it's a great resource, but I want you to know that I previously worked for them. But these three resources that are out there, and there's numerous others online, provide opportunities for students in classrooms to go online and connect and collaborate with others around the globe. So once again, this is the online research and media skills model. This is a class that we've set up to provide a, a free open primer to these different aspects of the model. This is a way for us to integrate these online research and media skills, but also the use of new and digital literacies or, or digital text and tools or technology or whatever we want to call it into what should be happening in the classroom into the Common Core State Standards, into the authentic use, the effective use of technology to positively, hopefully positively, affect student learning objectives. This video was focused on online collaborative inquiry and it fits into the other learning resources and videos in this module.